Our first presenter is Heather Rinaldi. And, and honestly, I'm going to have Heather tell you about Heather. That's the best way to learn about people. She's with the Texas Worm Ranch. Ranch. And I'm really, really, really happy. I was explaining to her today <coughs> about how fortunate we are to have a local worm supplier. Because for those of us that have been composting forever, finding worms or teaching a class on worms back in the day, in, in the early days, we had to order from far away. My supplier had been Mary Applehoff's group um, up in Seattle. And we had just stuck with her. And now that we have a local supplier, yay, I don't have to do that. We can get them from Heather. All right, Heather, you're on. This is your thing. All right. And Heather is, let me tell you, she's going to talk about urban farming in general. <laughs> okay. Wise. Thank you, Fran. There you go. All right. Uh, my name is Heather Rinaldi, and I am the owner and chief worm rancher at the Texas Worm Ranch. Um, I have a couple of worm wranglers and a reluctant uh, worm husband, Mr. Worm Rancher. Um, but I am a little different than most people who are from an urban setting. Um, I actually grew up on, in farm and ranch land. Uh, I grew up with hens, I grew up with horses. We had uh, sheep, paid my way through college. My 4-H uh, sheep herd did. And, uh, but after college, it was very tough in those early 90s, late 80 years to find a job uh, in rural Oklahoma. It's still pretty hard to find a job in rural Oklahoma. And so I made the crazy trek down here to Dallas uh, to work for, at the time, Texas Instruments. And that was in 1993. And somehow that got turned into, I'm an urban farmer uh, you can't take a country girl out of her, uh, what is inherent in her blood, I guess. Um, but some of my earliest memories are of gardening, uh, both with my parents and with my grandparents. And just the uh, nostalgia and deja vu feelings I get sometimes of, you know, I, I can remember my grandfather doing this, or that taste of picking the cherry tomato right off the vine and, and popping that in your mouth, that, you know, that taste that you have in your memory. Those are the things that I think really pull you in to wanting to be uh, connected to your food and making that plunge to be an urban farmer. I'm gonna guess that a lot of people here are already doing some sort of urban farming. Uh, you may be composting, you may have a garden, you may even have hens, or even a fruit or nut tree, and those are all things that can push you into that area of, hey, I'm a farmer, I'm a worm rancher. Um, so several years ago, well, let me back up a second. Uh, I moved here in 93, and you know, for a few years I did the apartment scene, and even in apartments, I'd always have basil or a cherry tomato plant or something like that on my balcony. So really, you can farm just about anywhere. Uh, in 98, I moved into my first home, and literally the first thing I did was start a garden. Uh, then I got to learn about city farming and those crazy squirrels and how they can eat every tomato off your uh, vine if you're not watching. Uh, so I started lots of learning with that. Uh, I guess it was 2003, we moved into a, another home. First thing that went into our home wasn't decor, uh, wasn't uh, updating or painting the house. It was a garden uh, because that's, that's what is in my blood. Um, so let's talk a little bit about urban farming and please ask questions anytime along the way. Um, urban farming isn't a new trend. It really is just new to us. But ancient civilizations like uh, Machu Picchu the, uh, in Peru, uh, even over in, in Greece, all kinds of, ur of urban farming has been going on for a long, long time. Um, what we call urban farming is growing food, and or sustaining ecosystems in a city environment. 
because it doesn't necessarily have to be a food crop that you're producing. Um, these uh, ecosystems or food could be for your own family's personal use. Um, it could be for gifts or donations. I know lots of people who are growing gardens to give to food banks or just uh, maybe they have a pecan tree and every Christmas they give bags of pecans to their neighbors or friends or family. Um, you can also start a business. Uh, my own business turned out to be an accidental business. Uh, I got some community garden plots to uh, go with my home plot, garden plot, and I started getting so much space that I needed more and more organic uh, <coughs> amendments to take care of my, my, my stuff. And so I was researching and found out about worm composting. I got my first little bin and started worm composting. I started making a product called Worm Wine, uh, which is just a worm casting tea. And I started spraying that on my vegetable garden plots at my community garden. And I'd put some of the worm castings around my plants at the, at the community garden. And within a couple of months, all the other gardeners were saying, we don't know what you're doing, but we want some of that. Um, so I started selling them worm wine. That's when I named it. I didn't name it before then. And actually have a trademarked name of worm wine. And they started using that and they're like, this is so wonderful. We want to raise our own worms. So then I had to grow more worms so I'd have enough for sale. And then they started telling their friends outside of the community garden. And that was about four years ago. And at one point, about two years ago, I realized I have 45 worm bins in my garage. If my, that's pretty crazy. If my husband comes down and counts these worm bins, he's gonna call the guys with white coats. Um, so that week I actually uh, found a warehouse space. Now I have a warehouse. I have employees, I ship worms all over the country, and I never thought I'd be a worm rancher. Where did this come from? <laughs> but it's, it's a lot of fun. I get to meet lots of wonderful people. I get to share my passion for organics and uh, self-sustaining. So it, it really is great, and I can usually work it into my kids' soccer game schedules and all that, so you can even make a business out of your passion. Um, so, I want to call this our new urban farm um, because the urban farm of today is probably different uh, from our grandfather's urban farm. Um, we could have crop production that could be food, which is obvious, uh, could be fiber. I actually know people who raise silkworms in the city and uh, create silk for uh, a business. Um, could be green manures. You could be uh, making crops uh, in the winter time to till under into your vegetable garden, and so that would be called a green manure. Um, wood. You know, a lot of times if someone has an acre, they may have an area that has trees that are falling down. Uh, they may use that wood for woodworking. Uh, they may use it for firewood, and so wood is also something. At medicine, if you grow aloe vera or medicinal herbs, that is something <coughs> that we would consider uh, crop farming. And then there's compost materials. I would say that I don't really raise compost materials, but when you have an, a vegetable garden, there is so much vegetation that you don't use that it automatically is just a great source of composting material. Uh, then, of course, we have animal production. Uh, meat, milk, if you were to have a dairy goat, uh, probably not going to have a dairy cow here in the city. Uh, eggs, of course, and that could be from any source of poultry. Uh, my, my parents still raise hens. Uh, they have guineas, they have ducks, they have geese. They don't live in the city, but any kind of poultry is going to provide those eggs. Uh, honey from our honeybees and animal food. Uh, one of the smartest things you can do as an urban farmer is to learn about black soldier flies. Uh, these are flies that do not have a mouth. 
uh, so they don't bother humans. They have no vectors for human disease, and they're, they love to lay their eggs in our compost. And so those uh, black soldier fly larvae are, get to be about this big, and they furiously work through your compost, and they are a great protein source for your poultry, a great free protein source for your poultry. And if you've priced uh, chicken scratch or any kind of poultry food, free beats $30 a bag for organic chicken scratch. So it's a great protein source, it's a natural source, and I highly recommend learning more about black soldier fly larvae. Um, I have lots of friends who are doing uh, both aquaculture and or aquaponics, and that is mixing growing fish and using their wastewater to fertilize plants. And so it's a closed loop cycle. And guess what one of the food sources for the fish can be? Those black soldier fly larvae. And so it's something that's integrated and can really provide a lot of food and sustenance for your family. Uh, even for animals, there's fiber. You know, whether it's wool or ang <laughs> angora goat hair uh, or the silkworms, they can provide fiber. Um, one of the biggest benefits of having animals is their manure because you can throw that into your compost and compost that and then you have that integrated uh, cycle again of, you know, the animal manure can be used for the crops. You probably give a little bit of the crops back to the animals and you can uh, help pay for some of that animal upkeep that way. All right. Um, something that I am really looking more into is fruit, nut, and berry production. Uh, I prefer to feed my family organic food, uh, and especially berries really have a lot of chemicals in those when you go to the grocery store. Um, they have to spray fungicide on there to keep it from molding uh, in the container. Um, there's a lot of uh, pesticides and herbicides and etc. chemical fertilizers uh, that are on those berries. I prefer to not feed that to my children and so I have been putting in all kinds of blackberry bushes this season uh, after the heat died down and so we're hoping for a good berry crop next year. It's been a couple of year cycle. We started with a couple. I'll tell you, I'll give you one learning that I found. We started with two blackberry bushes, and I thought we would just have tons and tons of berries. What I didn't know, and no one told me, and I didn't find it in the literature, was that you have to have several different, at least two different varieties of blackberries for them to have the bigger fruit. If you have, uh, your blackberries are all the same variety, you're gonna have small fruit. So if you decide to put in a couple of blackberry bushes, make sure you get a couple of different uh, uh, varieties there. And so you can learn from my mistakes. But hopefully now that we have some different varieties, we'll start having bigger, uh, bigger berries. Uh, blueberries are difficult uh, because they need acidic soil. Now, if you were to acidify your soil and have a lot of nice, loose, compostable soil, uh, then you could do blueberries. I know some people are trying to grow blueberries in big containers, um, so that would be a, an easier option instead of uh, trying to remediate our clay soil and make it acid instead of alkaline. You might be able to do that in big containers. But then big containers can dry out and get hotter, so there's a, a negative of that. So yes, but with difficulty. You could do that. Um, you know, there are also, uh, oh gosh, figs love our soil and our temperatures. We actually have a, an alley by our house that we call Fig Alley, and we'll go by and grab figs right down the alley. Um, it's on a waterway. It's not really owned by anyone, and so that's a, an example of what I would call guerrilla gardening or guerrilla harvesting. Um, I'm 
last year I was the um, environmental liaison for the PTA at my kids' school, and they had blackberry bushes in their butterfly habitat that someone had put there before. And the, the, what time of year are blackberries harvestable? June. And who's at school in June? Nobody. So I would actually get up early in the morning, walk my dog down to the school before my kids got up, pick blackberries, wash them, and have blackberries for, for breakfast. Um, so gorilla gardening, gorilla farming uh, is something that you can do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, another thing that we can look at is soil building and water conservation. And I'm going to uh, go back to soil building several times. That's actually really the business that I'm in. Um, you know, I can call myself a worm rancher, but what I'm really trying to do is get worm castings to improve our soil and add compost uh, to our soil. And I put that on our yard, I put that in my gardens, anything I can do to help the fertility of our soil, that's probably one of the biggest benefits of f urban farmers that, that, we, can, that we can do. Um, species habitat, uh, helping our endangered species or, or critically declining species, our butterflies, our honeybees, our hummingbirds, uh, those are something that we can do. It's kind of a byproduct of our urban farming. We need those honeybees to pollinate our, uh, our gardens and our, our berry plants. And so if we can incorporate uh, some of that species habitat, that's also going to help our, our gardens and our trees. All right, you can also grow cut flowers. All right, so what does the new urban farm look like? And this uh, picture <coughs> right there, uh, that's a funny picture to me because that was pretty much my garage worm operation the first three months of my new urban farm uh, experiment in worm composting. Uh, now we have, like I said, a warehouse with four by eight bins, wooden bins, uh, you know, growing large quantities of worm castings and worms. Uh, right there is just one of my community garden plots. Those are some broccoli plants early in the stage. Uh, we have an urban chicken coop. Uh, this is some beehives at our community garden. And let's see, right there, that is my front bed, landscaping bed and those are tomato plants. Mm -hmm. And so we're on a block with all these kids and they see tomatoes and I try not to get too upset <laughs> um, because I want them to have that same connection and experience with you know, vegetables that I do. Um, I kind of call my generation and maybe your generations the lost generations. We might remember our grandparents gardening maybe not so much our parents, and then most people of our generation have completely lost connection of what real food tastes like, uh, the, the nutritional benefits of it, and how in the world do you do it? Doesn't it come in a neat frozen package? And um, so that's really reconnecting us to learning how to grow and the joys and the taste of experiencing that is what we're trying to do here. Um, in this picture, this is actually some cut flowers from my beds. Uh, I took some of those to a farmer's market. Most Saturday mornings, I actually go to farmer's markets and I sell organic produce, I sell worms, I sell worm castings, and I sell the worm wine. It's really a storyboard. You know, I show people uh, we eat, we feed our scraps to the worms. The worms make the worm castings. We put that in our gardens. Look at our beautiful organic produce. Look how gorgeous that is. We eat that, we feed the scraps to the worms, 
And so it's a story and, and interconnects that story. Um, so even with the, the flowers, you know, those are organic flowers. And I explained to people that when you bring cut flowers into your home, they're typically from thousands of miles away. And they have been sprayed with all kinds of pesticides and herbicides. And you're bringing those chemicals straight into your home. So changing that and growing them in your front yard or backyard or in a species habitat and not using the chemicals and exposing your family to that, it, it's, a, it's a huge benefit. All right, and then you're probably wondering what this crazy mess is right there. And it's a little hard to see. Let's see if I can point one out. But that is a black soldier fly larva. And so they really like high nitrogen uh, sources and can convert that very quickly into compost. So worms, you can't feed any meat and you're not going to want to put a lot of bread products or grain products into your worm bin, but the black soldier fly love that. Uh, this summer, I actually started a process where we would put a bin on top of my worm bins, which are open bins, and we would put all of our high nitrogen waste in those worm bins. And this is an, an indoor uh, warehouse. Magically, the black soldier flies arrive, they lay their eggs, they would process that food. We had holes in the bottom. Uh, the black soldier flies kind of make it very liquidy. That would flow down into the worm bins and the worms would congregate there and repurpose uh, or eat that uh, black soldier fly compost and make it a lot more uh, nutrient, a, a lot better nutrient source. The compost from the black soldier flies isn't such a great compost to use straight into your garden, but if you were to use it in a general hot composting system or then let the worms uh, have that, then it would be a great source for your garden. So you have compost and food source for your poultry or fish. All right, so where do you urban farm? I have a, a garden in my backyard. I have a drought tolerant bee butterfly hummingbird uh, habitat real close to my garden to support my garden. Uh, that way I have my pollinators. I have lots of birds who come to that area and so the birds eat a lot of the pests so I don't have to uh, take care of too much pest control. Um, in my front yard, we saw that my front bed, um, edible landscaping. As a side business, I also uh, go build organic vegetable gardens in people's yards. And I have, one of my favorite ones is surrounding a swimming pool as an edible landscape. And I actually built one, I think I have a picture of one that I built in someone's front yard um, just uh, last month. Uh, if you're an apartment dweller, on your patio, you can grow herbs or small vegetables. Question? No. no. Okay. Uh, container gardening. Along my driveway, I have large containers. It's really difficult to grow root vegetables in our lovely uh, clay soil. I'm kidding. Um, so having containers, large containers, I can make my own very loose soil in those containers and I can grow my carrots and my beets and other root vegetables in those containers much easier than I can amending our clay soil. Um, you know, even with containers, a salad, if you're an apartment dweller, you can grow your own salad bowl in your containers and just cut and come again and go out and trim what you need. Uh, a sunny window is a great place for some herbs. Uh, rooftop, lots of hotels are now uh, having rooftop gardens so that they can supply their uh, chefs with that. Uh, feed sacks, right here is an example of growing a garden in feed sacks. So they just put their uh, garden soil or compost in the feed sacks and that's how they're growing. Um, community garden, 
I have two uh, community garden plots, and so that's an extra way to, to do your urban farm. Uh, a lot of people might have issues in their own yard. It may be too shady, uh, they may have a pool, there may be some issue there. Um, so what we're seeing as a national trend is a lot of people are actually doing a garden share. They'll work with a neighbor and say, I'll do your garden on your land because you don't have that big pecan tree giving all the shade and I'll give you 50% of the produce. And so that's an option as well. And then we go to that gorilla garden. Um, you know, I give you a couple of examples of gorilla harvesting. Uh, there are benefits and negatives to the gorilla gardening. I actually, at our community garden, we have a uh, waterway behind our community garden. And so, you know, in my mind, that's just more garden space that's farming space that isn't being used. And so I actually planted some uh, blackberry bushes out there. And they were doing great. But then the city of Dallas, in all its wisdom, decided, hey, there's a natural waterway back there. We must pave that. And um, so, unfortunately, my uh, blackberry bushes got paved. Uh, but I still have visions of blackberry bushes poking through the cracks in the pavement <laughs> because they're pretty, uh, uh, they can be pretty persistent like that. Okay, here's my uh, picture of a garden I put in the front yard <coughs> of one of my garden customers. And how many salads could you make out of that uh, bowl of lettuce if you, you know, kept it cut and coming again? And then here's an example of, in a sunny window, growing your own herbs. And so really you can urban farm just about anywhere. All right, let's talk about the past and the present a little bit more. In the past, in the, until the 1850s, nearly every family had their own dairy cow. Um, you know, you hear the story of the fire of Chicago and Mrs. O'Leary's cow. I blame Mrs. O'Leary for the decline in urban farming. Just kidding. Um, Back then, everybody had their own hens, and pretty much everybody had a garden. Uh, they did not have easy transportation or refrigeration. Uh, families preserved seeds to use the next year, and so many varieties of vegetables were available. Um, they canned, they dried, they smoked their meat, or they salted their meat to preserve it. Uh, most people made the food that they ate. And today, at least in my neighborhood, that is a rarity. Uh, in the 1850s, and really up until World War II, uh, they would use their composted manure as fertilizer. So that dairy cow had a purpose, not just of providing milk and also a calf uh, for beef, uh, but the manure was very valuable as a compost source for fertilizer for their gardens. And with all of these small food systems, only small areas were tilled and exposed. So only small areas of soil instead of vast fields of soil were being tilled. Where I grew up, across the road, uh, from us to the south was a wheat field. And let me tell you what happens when in Oklahoma, where a light breeze is 40 miles an hour, uh, when a wheat field gets tilled and you are on the north end of that wheat field, guess what happens? You, no reason to dust, because you can dust and within 30 minutes, you're gonna have this, this much soil uh, back in your home. Um, so small areas, probably with trees and bushes nearby to break that wind, um, were, were good compared to these large acreages which are letting our topsoil blow away, wash away, etc. All right, so World War II happened and we had 
all this science going on in World War II. And with all those uh, scientific breakthroughs at the end of World War II, we also had all these excess munitions. And so all these munitions would have ammonia and uh, that can be used as a fertilizer. So of course we had to find a marketplace for this. And what better place to find a marketplace than uh, to use as a fertilizer for our crops. So we created synthetic fertilizer. Uh, we started having widespread mechanization. So we'd have tractors pulling the, the plows and uh, combines and all that. Uh, early 1900s, we had the assembly line. Uh, Henry Ford brought the assembly line, so we applied that to our food system. We tilled those large areas. Uh, chemical pesticides and herbicides were uh, brought to the marketplace. And here in the last uh, 30 years, genetically modified organisms uh, started being you know, brought to us. Uh, when I was a child, a long time ago, um, we didn't put hormones into our animals. Uh, when I was in my teenage years uh, and was in 4-H and FFA, they started really checking the ears of the animals because people would give them hormone boluses in their ears. And so there was you know, kind of a controversy at the time, should we allow these 4-H and FFA animals to have hormones or not? And a lot of people would try and get away with it. And so hormones started being uh, brought into our food system in, you know, probably about 30 years ago uh, in mass, mass ways. Um, so that's something new. Uh, you know, People have varying opinions. Do hormones, are hormones okay or are they, are they not okay? Um, is it good for the animals? Is it not good for the animals? Good for us, good for our children? Who knows, lots of controversy out there about that. Um, also, when I was a kid, most of my uh, farms were owned by local farmers. Uh, in the late 70s, uh, there was a great opportunity for farmers. Wheat had gone up like this, and so these farmers were trying to plow and till and plant as much wheat as possible. They were uh, getting loans for new equipment, new combines, and so life was good. They were building bigger homes, and it was great to be a farmer. But then the saving and loans uh, scandal started happening, and those started crashing, and wheat started uh, going downhill, and the price of cattle started going downhill. And so all the farms surrounding us that had wheat and large cattle operations started going bankrupt. And so a lot of times what would happen is the banks would actually own the, the farms, and then they'd lease it to other people. A lot of times not the uh, generational farmers who'd been there before. So we started seeing people not really care as much about the conservation of those farms and they would put way too many cattle on the grasslands and all of a sudden you'd have just barren weedy patches with cockleburs because they'd overgrazed or they'd have uh, fields that were losing fertility because they were being overworked. And so those are some things that happen. Our ways of seeing food. Uh, with our first space explorations, we started learning about the TV dinner. They actually made TV dinners, uh, and that was the new way. It's so easy to just put it in the oven or the microwave. Uh, we're going to drink tang and, you know, all these other things that really changed uh, the way of food. You know, lots of advertising. We're going to make it so easy on you housewives, and that way the housewife can go to work. And so it went from uh, what we see where we're preserving seeds, we're canning, we're drying, we're smoking, we're salting. Boy, that's a lot of work, isn't it? To now, so we're going to let someone else process that food for you, i.e., now we have processed foods. 
Um, we even have new things, you know, high fructose corn syrup. Well, whatever happened to sugar? <laughs> um, so lots of changes. But obviously with the people in this class, what I would say is the more things change, the more they say stay the same. Yes? I do have a quick question. Sure. I know you talked about the GMOs. Uh, yes. There's a book that I read recently within the last couple of years that talked about the uh, company Monsanto. Uh-huh. And the, the author or author that they, he, that organization may have appeared in more than one book that I read, but the, they had a not very favorable position about that organization. Um, my personal opinion is I don't want my family eating genetically modified organisms. I don't think putting a fish or pig gene into a tomato is a good idea. And I am very concerned about the consequ long-term consequences of that. And uh, Monsanto, you know, I hate to get into political conversation, but they're doing things like in India, in Iraq, and all over the world, they're uh, taking the seeds that those agriculturists have used for millennia, and instead they're saying, you can't use those seeds Go ahead and use our seeds. Oh, and by the way, they aren't open pollinated, so you'll have to buy seeds every year versus being able to keep some of your seeds and replant those every year. Um, so that's, in my mind, a monopoly when one company is the only one who owns our seed source. So you are uh, all subversives for being here today. Um, <laughs> You know, you're, you're really rebel rousers for growing, trying to grow your own food. And the, the, <coughs> one of the books that I read that mentioned that also said that that company would sue farmers that inadvertently had their, you know, lands planted with their, the, those other, that Monsanto yes. crop. And, and, and yes. Yes. And the Monsanto, uh, the GMOs actually cross-pollinate with your other seed sources. And so what used to be varieties of seeds now all have the same uh, blueprint, genetic blueprint. And it's now that you have to now buy seeds of canola is a, a great example. Uh, they did it with canola and now all of our canola oil is pretty much a genetically modified organism. Um, all right. So good reasons to grow your own. Uh, Nutrition, we've, with our declining soil fertility, we've seen declining uh, nutrition values in our food. Um, we don't have as, as high a, an amount of vitamins and minerals in our food anymore. Uh, we've seen processed foods, and that's a topic that's in the headlines. Uh, chemicals, both in our food from the chemicals that are put on it in uh, big agriculture, and also in our packaging. You know, most of our canned uh, food has BPA, uh, which they've found can cause all kinds of endocrine disruption, which means we might have cancer, we might have embryonic changes, we may have fertility issues in, in humans. Um, so these are things to consider. Um, we have chemicals in our environment. You know, the more chemicals you spray on those big fields of corn, the more is in our uh, riverways, in waterways, Gulf of Mexico, etc. Um, so it's not just what you do in a field, it's it, uh, what you do in that field impacts everything from that field to us eating it to the Gulf of Mexico and all the fish and m mammal life in our, in our oceans. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, other things that we talk about are the cost of food transportation. A lot of times that's directly related to our oil consumption and the amount of uh, petroleum it, we need to produce that food. Um, we've already talked about genetically modified organisms, but here's one of my favorite things, loss of taste. A tomato from the grocery store does not taste like a tomato. Um, it's now genetically modified and 
it's not really a tomato anymore. Um, and they've made it so that it's really made for transportation and not for taste and to look uniform to every other tomato. And that's what my generation is looking for when they go to the grocery store. They don't want the ugly tomato with the beautiful taste. They want the uh, one that looks just like everything else. All right, so loss of taste is important. Pathogens. We've been hearing a lot about those uh, cantaloupes that are killing people. Uh, funny story, my, my next door neighbor is also my neighbor at the community garden, and she had a bumper crop of cantaloupes this year. And so she was giving them to some of our other neighbors, and so one of the neighbors came to me and said, is it okay for my family to eat this cantaloupe? Is it gonna kill us? And I said, no, it's fine for you to eat that cantaloupe. It was grown organically two miles, uh, actually a mile away, and you should always wash your fruits and vegetables no matter where they're grown um, before you slice into it, and that probably would have prevented the, the deaths of the other uh, people eating cantaloupe. But this is not the grocery store cantaloupe that has come from hundreds or thousands of miles away, gone through processing centers, possibly grown near a, a, you know, a factory animal farm. This is different. This is a safe food source. Um, so we've seen salmonella. We've seen E. coli. Uh, we've seen antibiotic resistance because our dairy cows and our animals are being given so much antibiotics antibiotics that it's making uh, bugs that are antibiotic resistant. Um, so that's something that's very important. Uh, we've seen swine flu and bird flu from large populations of animals closely confined. Uh, that those bugs can switch species and all of a sudden become an issue for us. Uh, we've seen the impact of, on the environment that we had just talked about uh, with big ag causing a large carbon footprint. And then last, but in my mind not least, is our topsoil. Uh, we're losing our topsoil. We've plowed under the prairie. And prairie perennials, uh, the plants in the prairie, have extremely long root systems. I've seen uh, scientists that have pulled up plants that had 10 feet long uh, root systems. So imagine that holding our soil together in those prairies. Our prairies were there to support large herds of buffalo and antelope and lots of herd animals, uh, not to be plowed under and for that fertile soil uh, to be blown to, you know, New Mexico or wherever. Um, so our, we've also lost our soil ecosystem. Most, most of us uh, don't realize when we're walking across our yard, if we haven't killed all our soil ecosystem off with chemicals, there are millions of microscopic animals and fungi and uh, bacteria in our yard that are there for soil fertility. They're decomposers etc. So we've lost our soil uh, ecosystem when we've plowed all that up and applied large amounts of chemicals to that soil ecosystem. Uh, somebody's interested in, um, in seeing some of what that prairie land or what the, the area would have been like before all of these developments. Um, you can go uh, just south of the dam uh, at Lake Louisville. There's a place called the Lake Louisville Environmental Learning Area. Uh, where which is the Corps of Engineers project, and one of the things that they're doing there is trying to restore or allow a, a section to go back to Blackland sort of Prairie. Original, uh, its original state, and I, I think they're even moving in bison and things like that, to, just to you know mainly just as a a way to look at what that what that looked like. Sure, sure, great, thank you. Okay, so soil erosion according to this scientist, is second only to population growth as the biggest environmental problem the world faces. Yet the problem, which is growing ever more critical, is being ignored because who gets excited about dirt? Well, I like to eat, so I get very excited about dirt, 
And I hope if there's one thing I can instill in you guys is just start to think a little bit more about that soil ecosystem and how we can support that soil ecosystem. All right, so quickly, why have an urban farm? For me, it is my therapy. I do not have to go to a shrink. I just need to go to my garden and spend a lot, little time listening to the birds, uh, seeing the bees work, pulling some uh, fresh produce. The only time it's not so joyful and therapeutic is in August. 110 is not exactly uh, therapeutic for anybody. But it's fun. It's interesting. It's a great way to learn. Um, so it's a learning and bonding opportunity. Um, I'm actually getting chills right now thinking back to gardening with my grandfather and uh, just how wonderful that is. And this is one of my little girls a couple of years ago. She's grown up more since then, but uh, she's husking some corn and she looks pretty happy there. She's my earthworm digger and uh, butterfly kisser and all that. Um, health exercise. Uh, each September and spring, for some reason I lose about five pounds because that's when I'm redoing my gardens and that's a lot of work. Um, so it's health, it's stress reduction. When I go to the gardens, it is definitely stress reduction. Um, nutrition, you know, last night for dinner I made a soup. It was a lamb sausage, cannellini bean, and Swiss chard soup. We had a salad with everything in it came from our garden. And I had some artisan bread, whole grain bread that I had bartered with another vendor at the farmer's market. So that what made me so happy to have that nutritious meal, organic food for my family. Um, my husband who wanted the big piece of meat and wasn't such a soup eater kind of complained, but I, I got him in the shape. Um, <laughs> Uh, finances, you know, I want to feed my family organically. You go to the store right now, organic tomatoes are $6 a pound. That chard is organic about $3 a pound. It's crazy. And chard grows like crazy here. It will stay fresh all year long. So, you know, it's, you can eat a lot eat better, a lot more healthy, and a lot less cost if you're growing it your own. Now, there's a caveat to that. Before I started the worm ranch, and the reason I started the worm ranch is when you go to the nurseries and try and buy organic amendments, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have a $60 tomato. And so if you can ha make your own compost, and I worm compost because it's very nutrient dense compared to regular compost, if you make your own amendment doing that, you can contain those costs a lot better. All right, we've talked about the environment. You're really making a huge environmental impact if you grow your own. Uh, taste, obviously. Uh, pets, you know, if you have your own hens or a goat, you're going to see them as pets, you know, really. So, um, you know, this one right here every day asks for some different animal to be on our, uh, you know, quarter of an acre. <laughs> uh, food security. Several years ago when they thought all, when they wouldn't sell tomatoes, guess what we had at our house? Lots and lots of tomatoes. So it was kind of a, you know, we have, we have our own food security there. Um, you know, the cantaloupes, we talked about that control over what goes in your food. I, could, I know what I put in my food. I know it's safe for our family. I have control over its handling. I know I'm washing it and I'm not leaving it out in a place out in the hot sun or someplace that it's going to be exposed to pathogens. Um, also human rights. More and more information is coming out that the tomatoes that are grown in Florida, are the, some of the workers there are almost under slavery. Um, they are being forced to work, they're getting less than minimum wage, and they're being given housing that they have to spend as much or more on their housing, forced housing, to work on those farms 
than they're able to make. And some of the uh, women are being exploited um, sexually, and th some of them, most of them are here illegally, and so they have no rights. And they can't go say something to the uh, police, or they'll be the ones in trouble, and they'll be deported. Um, so, yes, I use child labor, and so I'm violating some human <laughs> rights, probably. Um, but I actually, I, I think I turned out okay, and I worked a lot harder than these girls do. Um, also, if it's animals, you know, are the chickens in a small battery cage uh, with no ability to, to move? Um, so humane conditions for animals is also something to consider. All right, so there are lots of challenges for urban farming. Um, I think we're going to have someone talk about city ordinances, so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, homeowners associations, know your rules. Neighbors, best way to deal with neighbors is give them some uh, gifts once in a while. You know, here, have some tomatoes. Here, have some lettuce. Here, have a cantaloupe and, or some eggs, and that will help uh, keep your neighbors uh, happy. Um, now, on the flip side of that, sometimes you have neighbors who are stealing your food, um, or you may have yard crews who are stealing food. And um, I actually have a client who has to lock her vegetable area, and she has a peach tree there every time her yard crew comes, because you know they have different people working on the yard crew, so even if the supervisor says, don't take that, he may not remember the next time to tell someone on the crew not to take that. So if you have a peach tree, which might have 20 edible peaches on it, and the yard crew comes out, and there's 10 guys on the yard crew, and they each eat you know, two peaches, then you have no peaches for yourself. So definitely neighbors can be an issue. City critters are definitely an issue. Squirrels are awful. You know, If we live down in Austin or the Hill Country, deer would be a problem. Um, so here's a, uh, a somewhat secure er way to grow your food. Here in Dallas, I would, or the DFW area, I'd put a roof on that, of a screen on that, because those squirrels are awful. Um, another way to deal with the squirrels, if you have a tomato, the minute you see any color at all, take that tomato off the vine. Because not only do you keep it from the pests, it's going to ripen unless you put it in the refrigerator and then it stops ripening, but it's going to ripen and then that plant has energy to grow more food instead of keeping energy to that uh, ripening fruit. Uh, birds are also an issue. Cats, armadillos, I heard someone talking about armadillos. Dogs, if you have um, hens or goats, do city dogs can definitely be your worst fear. Um, I highly recommend excellent fencing to keep those stray dogs out of, of your goats or hens. Um, I live, you know, I grew up out in the country, and after I went to college, my family still had some sheep until one day some of the farm dogs were loose, and they went out and pretty much within about 10 minutes slaughtered all the sheep that my parents had. So it doesn't take very long to happen. It's very messy. And remember, they're probably going to be your pets, too. It's going to be very hard on your family. Uh, just speaking of squirrels and cats and stuff, um, maybe get a pair of greyhounds like we have. <laughs> After a little while, um, <laughs> the squirrels and the cats don't yeah. come in our yard. So. Um, also, putting forks. I like to get uh, low-cost forks and stick those up in uh, garden beds to keep the cats from coming and using the bathroom in your garden beds. All right, let's get through this pretty quickly. Uh, one of the biggest issues is our lack of education. You know, we have never grown food before, people of our generation, uh, or we're coming from different regions. If you're from Wisconsin or Iowa, things just grow magically. Here in Dallas, our Dallas area, not so much. Uh, so I know they're gonna talk about this, but our clay soil is an issue. Um, I recommend raised beds, seasons. Uh, I had some of, the, some of my friends started to grow their own gardens and they'd come to me and say, 
Well, we put our lettuce in in July and it never, it never grew. You have to, because it's too hot for lettuce in July, you have to know what to grow when. Uh, know how and when to harvest. You don't wait for your okra to get this long to harvest. It is inedible. Um, yes. Know how to serve and preserve. Lots of my clients or friends are like, well, I grew this, but I don't know how to cook it. And so using resources. Fertilizing, mulching, thinning, disease, pests. I'm going to tell you the internet is your best resource. Google is your best resource. If you don't know a, an answer to a question, just Google it. And then you have our city services, our extension services. Um, so Facebook's with locals with experience. And I put on here there are no experts because you never really know everything. Um, Every year, all the time, I learn something new. I'm brought to my knees with some new pest or disease or issue. Um, so keep learning. Um, space. I love to buy seeds and plants. Those are my shoes. You know, most women buy shoes. I, but I, I am in denial. I don't have a seed buying problem. I have a space, lack of space problem. Um, shade. Lots of people have big shady yards. There are plants you can grow. Lettuce and spinach and greens, they can be grown in shade. But don't try and grow tomatoes in shade. That will not work. Uh, time. That's my biggest resource that I wish I had more of. Um, don't get yourself in over your head. Start small. Learn as you grow. Learn what you can handle. Uh, how much watering and care do you want to do when it's 110 degrees? And that's how you should limit the size of your urban farm. Uh, having patience, that's definitely something that uh, waiting for those crops is hard. Life and vacations, you know, someone may get sick, you may have to go out of town for work, uh, get a partner and share the harvest. Weather, 110 is not good for anybody except okra, Bermuda grass and fire ants. Uh, here in our area, <coughs> I found smaller varieties just work better. Our big, huge tomatoes, j they just don't have enough time uh, to, to grow uh, before it gets too hot. Now the smaller varieties are going to fruit a lot better in the heat. Uh, winter, you can have winter hardy vegetables and hoop houses can help too. Spring and fall, your 10-day forecast is your best bet for spring and fall. If you are going to uh, plant new tomato transplants and the forecast is for 50 mile an hour winds for the next week, they're not going to have any foliage after that, that first week. Um, so look at that 10-day forecast and that's the, your best way to know when to plant. Uh, stake things firmly for our storms. When we have too much rain, we may have fungal disease. My worm wine is a great way to prevent fungal disease or stop fungal disease. Uh, milk is another way to stop fungal disease. You can actually mix some of your leftover milk and some water, go spray that on your plants, and the good bacteria in the milk will overcome the bad fungus in the, in the garden. Uh, drought, you know, heat tolerant plants, mulch, etc. All right, so coming to a close, um, hope that you're inspired to go grow, to learn more about your soil ecosystem. Um, something I say is nothing can keep you as humble as raising crops and animals and children. Uh, they constantly bring you to your knees. <laughs> um, but nothing gives you as much joy and satisfaction either. Um, remember your water, for yourself, take breaks, um, big hat and sunscreen, growing up as a, uh, and especially for your children. Um, I am getting ready to have my fourth surgery on my face for skin cancer. So little girl growing up out in the country, farm and ranch girl, sunscreen, didn't really do it. But now, please wear your big hat, wear your sunscreen, and make sure your kids are covered up too. Um, some good advice, keep your mouth closed while moving compost. 
Uh, another one I forgot to put up here, water with the wind, <laughs> not against the wind. Unless it's 110. Unless it's 110. <laughs> but trust me, in January, water with the wind. And happy farming. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. and in this next section, we're going to cover animals, and I know that that's, this is probably where you have the bulk of the questions and the curiosity. Anything, if, yeah, if, just flip everything up. There we go. <coughs> so everybody can see Bill, including the camera. Um, Bill, why don't you tell them what your role is. Now, Bill is here to cover the current ordinances related to animals, livestock, <laughs> Um, chickens and those and, and tell you some of the things he has seen. Basically to ensure the ordinance is followed for safety, public health for the people and the animals. Uh, what kind of farming are we looking at doing? Chickens and goats. Chickens and goats. goats. All right well right now at this time there's actually not anything on chickens so ordinance wise it basically they just have to be contained like animals but as far as population any laws or ordinances on roosters. The city of Irving doesn't have anything, but they do have proposed ordinances. So if any of you have chickens now, you may have to change up some of the ways you're containing them, where they're at, and make sure that they're kept clean and contained in a, in a humane confinement. How come you had a rule against roosters? No rule against roosters. Now there's a, there's a noise ordinance and if a rooster breaks the noise levels to where it disturbs the peace, just like a stereo or anything like that, then you could fall under the noise violation. But the roosters are still, at this point, not prohibited. There's not any limit on how many you can have, anything like that? Not at this time. Do you, do you know anything about what the proposed ordinances would, what limits there would be? Or For roosters? Or chickens in general? Okay. Uh, basically, they're looking at uh, restricting the number total to 10 fowl on one half an acre or less zone for residential. So unless you have some type of special zoning or something like that, any residential lot would be restricted to 10, and that would be one rooster per five. So. Well, <clears throat> that's the proposal. Right now, residential use or distance closer than 50 feet from any inhabitation of any other's property uh, would be restricted. Property? Well, I'm sorry, inhabited in a structure. Okay, of course. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> inhabited in a structure from the property line of which they're contained. So whatever the fence line is, that's where it would count up to their containment area. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Can yes, sir. The the restrictions that they're proposing for chicken coops and or chickens is their confinement area of the property line would be 50 feet away from the nearest inhabited building or structure. Hmm. Does that garages? Garages? Uh, well, if that garage is, is habitable and or attached to your home and considered a habitation, inhabitation, then yeah. To other people's homes. Right. That's correct. Neighboring, sorry. I'm sorry? I just wasn't clear on whether you meant from the edge of, so if there's an enclosure for the animals, you measure from that enclosure That's correct. To the, the confinement barrier. Okay, whether, no property line to their, in, unless, unless that's, that's the, unless correct. Unless have a and yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, well, I haven't moved into was farmland before the city was incorporated, so grandfather and people still have livestock when I moved there. Do they usually revoke something like that? Or? You know, I don't know anything about grandfathering, and that's kind of a, you know, within the, I guess, the city itself to decide what they're going to do, allow it or not. I, I don't have anything to do with that. Uh, ordinances are what I, I do enforce, and uh, I only know what the ordinances are. And, and whatever they were before, uh, you know, we'll come to that when that time comes. Can you speak to ordinances um, that uh, govern beekeeping? Ordinances that, uh, well, that's another thing. Right now they're, they're proposing change to it, and what we have that's actually on the books is, is very vague. Uh, 
basically it's saying now that you know you can you can have bees but you have to keep them in a clean environment you know and, and clean up around the area uh, bees well p some people will have a beehive and then they don't want to mow too close around it so the grass gets high and debris and stuff gets caught up in the area and it becomes a bit of a nuisance but Square footage on the bees. That's also, yeah, I believe that's 50 feet. Let me look. And I, I will interject here because I've had uh, Fred Sanderson, who's the manager of animal services, he has requested some input from me about this particular, these kinds of things. I'm a beekeeper, Dennis Blackner back there is a beekeeper. So if there are some things that you would like to input, I would definitely get with Animal Services with Fred Sanderson and email him some thoughts that you might have. If you're a beekeeper and 50 feet seems a little unreasonable or it's, uh, I would just definitely visit with them because these are proposed uh, ordinance changes and, um, and this is a good time for you to have some input into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as the proposed on the distance from the nearest structure, I'm not seeing anything on that. So basically it says the, the suggested to do would be uh, maintain each colony in a healthy state. And of course, you know, that should be fairly explanatory. Don't uh, have a bunch of unhealthy bees with a beehive that's all broken up, old. Uh, I'm sorry? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> maintain the grounds near each beehive in a sanitary manner. Maintain the, uh, ensure that the convenient source of water is available to the colony at all times. Bees also need water, or they're going to travel to get it. Uh, mark each hive with the name and telephone number of the beekeeper so that if anything happens that we can contact you and let you know and get someone out there. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't have anything on rabbits, but uh, at this time, basically, the, they have to be contained to your property. There's not any 50-foot barrier, no barrier to the next property. But uh, if you have a rabbit that doesn't have an enclosed structure and it's just kept in your backyard, you know what rabbits do. They burrow. They're going to dig. They'll get out. They're going to get in neighbor's yards, eat their flowers. So make sure you've got an adequate way to contain the animal and a shelter and food and water accessible to it. As far as bees, uh, any other requirements that the animal services manager may have, including but not to requiring a person to reduce the number of hives or requiring any other reasonable safety precautions in any of Perry in order to abate any nuisance. So, it's kind of vague there also, but it gives him the power that if you have too many hives and bees are just they're overtaking the neighbors or something, they'll have you reduce them and or get rid of them, basically. Keep it clean. Make sure you're not overdoing yourself with the number and the size of area that you have. Keep them healthy. Keep them contained. Make sure there's something identifying on the hive so that if anything happens, we can contact you and get you there to, to take care of it since it would be your responsibility. Anything else? Even if the hives are on your property, they have to be marked? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because there's a lot of times where people will rent or lease land and uh, the owner may not even be aware of it and they just want it marked on there clearly so that we can actually, at that time, we don't have to do research, contact people, can't get a hold of someone. We want to be able to have a good number, a good name, and a good backup plan to get a hold of you to get you there. Or that you can make arrangements for another keeper. Yes? What, what is your uh, information about feral cats? Feral cats. Well, feral cats are feral, so who owns them? Well, I mean, I have four of them. In my, that's, you have a colony? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all saved. So okay, are they, they are they vaccinated? Okay. How do we know that they're neutered or vaccinated? Oh, because the, the owner, the person I bought the house from, told me that, they, that the city came, got them, neutered them, or somebody did. Do they have any identifying marks showing that? Uh, I don't know. I don't, 
You notice any, anything on their ears? Okay. What, what you'd really probably want to do is go ahead and get them contained by trapping them. And you can get them to us or a nonprofit, or <clears throat> nonprofit organization. And what they'll do is they'll verify that they have been spayed or neutered, revaccinate the animal, and then clip the left ear. And in doing that, whenever you see an animal that doesn't have a jagged like a cat fight ear and it's been clipped. Yeah, they do, but then how often do you need to do that? Well, as far as the spay and neutering, it's a one-time deal. But uh, <laughs> vaccinate the animal. Right, right now uh, they've set this program up and it's, it's not really an ordinance. It's just kind of a good faith thing for the animals and the public. So what we're trying to do is just ensure that we get as many done out there as we can. That way that they don't multiply anymore. If you feel that they need to be revaccinated, you could, you could. Yeah, I've been there two years and, and they, nothing's been done. Then you could. But I can't trap them. I'm not going to do something. No, the city doesn't come out and do trapping on any private property. So if that property is owned, just like the trash on your property, you're responsible for maintaining it. Squirrels in the tree, birds that uh, take up in habitation, possums, raccoons, stray cats. We, we will uh, loan a trap out to you. We have traps available. If you call, give your name, they'll hold that trap till the end of the business day if it's available. And you can pick the trap up, fill out a little form state and you'll take care of it. There's no cost involved. Uh, you'll state you'll return it at the end of the time frame, what, 10, seven days, whatever that is. Anything you catch inside that trap during business hours, we will attempt to get there and get it removed. But anything, anyone traps on their own personal private property is responsible for whatever's in that trap because you're the trapper. That's why the city of Irving doesn't get involved with doing the trapping on. We can't be involved with making sure that every trap we have set on someone's property, we get there and check it for the welfare of the animal. That's correct. <laughs> However, yes, I do. 972 721 2256. Now, once you call, you're not resolved of any and all responsibilities, and the city's responsible now. You trap the animal, you're responsible up until the animal is humanely removed and or released. So, what happens is you'll need to keep it in a good environment if it's cold. You need to cover it up or bring it into a secure area, like a garage or something. But the, he doesn't come in into his house. The trap? The Catch it outside. But it has a handle. Then if, if it's cold or if it's raining, you got a hell store coming, you may not want to set it if you know that stuff's happening, okay, within the next 24 hours and then try it again the next day because it's not an instance where you have to catch that cat tonight or you're never going to get it. If he's a nuisance, he's, he's hanging around. Well, now feeding is harboring. So technically, <laughs> technically you're the harborer of a feral cat. And, and there's a lot of people that do that. And what they do is they take on their own responsibility for themselves to care for the animals because, yeah, and, and then it's, it's basically your feral cat. And, and they're coming up with a program where you can register your colony, okay? And I don't know if they plan on microchipping those animals or what to make sure that wherever that animal gets picked up, if it has a chip and or a way to identify that colony to make sure it gets back to where it belongs. <laughs> that way it's micro, uh, microchipped, vaccinated for sure, and they'd have records of when that animal was vaccinated and or spayed and neutered, and they would have all records of that animal. Um, feral cats at this point, it's a wild animal basically. You're not going to be able to contain it with the ordinance so it would fall under you know, a feral animal versus someone's pet. Uh, it's still a nuisance for a lot of people. They don't like the idea of feral animals, but it, it is a part of, uh, life. part of life, just like raccoons and possums. So and as long as they're vaccinated and, and spay and neutered and they're not breeding out of control, then we can all get along some point, hopefully. Do y'all release them back into the neighborhood? We release them to a nonprofit organization. After that, we don't handle the animals. Okay. So uh, the city does not uh, invoke in getting involved with. 
KittyCo is one, if not one of the uh, nonprofit organizations that the city. Oh, she has, so she's not spayed or neutered. She's not got a clipped ear. She's just a, well, get her in a trap. Get her in a trap. And if she asks kittens, how old are they? They're fairly well grown by, by the time I found them. Okay. Well, you know cats can start breeding fairly early, <laughs> but after two pounds, if you can guesstimate that, that'd probably be about a 10, 11 week old maybe. Uh, after about two pounds, that's when they're able to actually spay and neuter them. So they're not going to be getting pregnant or get, you know others pregnant at that age. So if you can wait up till then to start trapping them. Yeah. And I'll tell you one thing that would really help is if you do have them at that age after you trap the mother, prop the door on that trap and just feed them in the trap. That way they never get caught while they're too young. They can eat and they're used to going into it. That way when they get that size, they're not going to be spooked off by the first one that gets caught and never come back. And uh, you're out there trapping cats and when someone steals the trap, how much do you have to pay back to see? <laughs> I believe it's the cost of replacement of the trap and I think they have it. Last I heard it was at about 70, it may be $50. I'm not sure on all that. You could contact our office and ask them. So it's not a bad idea if you have a cable lock for a bicycle or a chain and a padlock, get it to a tree or something up by your garage. Try, you can also put something over the trap, some towel or something, which helps with the wind and the sun. Just make sure you keep some ventilation and airflow. Uh, as far as people seeing it, knowing what's going on, and think, oh, they're, they're trapping our cats and they're dumping them or something. And Yes, sir. Yes. What are the limitations? I mean, I'm sure if you're allowed to keep, you might be allowed to keep a goat, you're probably not allowed to keep a longhorn steer or something. Well, believe it or not, you can. You can. But there are guidelines on livestock, and livestock in general falls under two categories. There's livestock and then miniature livestock, which would fall under pygmy goats, uh, goats, uh, miniature horses, ponies, of that nature. Pot-bellied pigs is a different. Pigs fall under their own thing altogether. So with livestock, if you wanted a longhorn, you have to have 7,200 square foot of ranging area, yeah. open and accessible to him. And, and there are places in Irving that have over an acre lot, I mean, and you know, they can have livestock. Now if they do, they have to have 150 square foot of stable that's covered area for the animal, each animal, each head. Um, cannot come within 50 foot of their containment barrier to a neighboring inhabitable dwelling, which would be, I don't know, somebody maybe. But for things like goats or smaller, I mean, what, for one thing, what's the dividing line? Is it a size thing? Well, it would have to fall under the actual definition and whatever that is, is okay. for, for the animals. I mean, if you have a, you know, 800 pound steer or something out there and mm -hmm. You try and tell them, well, it's a miniature steer. <laughs> That'd probably come into you and the courts to decide. You'll get the ticket. And right, but I just mean, like, do goats fall under their own? Is that, that's Goat, the goats fall under the same as the miniature stuff. They are small. So goats, pygmy goats, sheep, uh, it's all going to be 1,800 square foot per head and 75 foot per covered stable area. So, and the 50 foot rule still applies as far as the neighboring inhabitants. Sorry, what was the covered area on the miniature? Miniatures is 75. Thank you. Now, can you tell them where the code can be found, the ordinance? Because you all can go on. Yeah. And read well, do they, do they have access to muni code? Uh-huh. I, I think it's available online through the city secretary's office. Okay. Uh, yeah, you could contact the city secretary's office. Uh, see if there's a way you can get on muni code because they have not only any animal ordinances any and all city ordinances the code enforcement side uh, so muni code is if, yeah that's what we actually use when you know we've got questions that's what we refer to and have to resource because you're never going to remember every ordinance i would i would contact 721 I'm sorry, 972721. 
2600 Right. Well, you can go to the cityofurban.org, yeah. yeah. click on departments, okay. click on city secretary, and you'll get their information there. And I Better to email? I think it's accessible online without Is even it? having calling them. Okay. 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 I think so. Find it or nothing on chickens. You checked? Yeah. Well, I would call the city secretary's office. No. On chickens? Yeah. That's because right now at this time, everything that I've discussed about chickens is proposed. That's why it's really good to get their, your input. If you want, if you want, if you think, you know, I don't think they should have roosters. Chickens are great, but roosters are loud, and I don't want my neighbor having two roosters because two roosters, one rooster, it's enough to wake me up. You know, let them know how you feel. If you think, man, there should be no restrictions on roosters, let them know because they're going to go off a general consensus of what the public wants. Get with Fred Sanderson, and I can. You're going to city departments at the city's website, cityofurbing.org. Click on uh, animal services, and his name will pop up as a man. Should have an email Should link, an email so if you wanted to Isn't communicate. Is there going on right now? The picket of brothers, certain brothers reading. There's a good public input on the rooster ordinance. I don't know when they're voting on the ordinance. Uh, that's something you could also contact the main city line on and find out when they're going to do a, uh, a vote on that. One more question here because we got two so comments. To do that, in terms of the voting and input, is that only through this emailing Fred Sanders or is that through public meetings or? With, with the voting? Well, well the, the proposed city ordinance, uh, obviously. Who would you talk to about it? Yeah, how, how's your input on well, that? Well, my recommendation would be go ahead and, you know, do a multiple link there, attach it to Fred Sanderson because, hey, he is the guy that really pushed the agenda and the initiative for the department itself. And then people who he talks to, which would be above him, which I'd go right to what? Well, Fred, the process on something like that would definitely be through uh, city management and then council. So and just. It's really important. They're, they're going to be updating the code. Really, really important to get some input. So it, public meetings on that or anything like that? I, I don't know that, but you can email Fred and ask about the, what process they're intending for public input. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's not in the animal department, so you could check with code enforcement on that because there may be some instances where, okay. I can address that. Okay. With composting, there are no codes, no ordinances, and I, I'd like to keep it that way, folks. So if you're, if you're wanting to do some composting out there, you really need to go to the composting class, which is a two-hour class with a master class, and, and learn, if you feel like you have some problems going on, learn how to do it correctly. We'll help you go through this process. If there's a problem out there from a, a person doing something they shouldn't be doing, it's usually a neighbor that calls and says, there's this big pile of I don't know what in my backyard. <laughs> Maybe doesn't, it doesn't even smell. Maybe. I assume it's smelling, it's just this pile. Mm -hmm. And uh, code usually comes to me and I go out and I'll take a look at it. And then we kind of do a quick remediation with the owner. So sometimes we think we know what we're doing and we're experiencing some problems. It's mm -hmm. not heating, it's smelling, it's, uh, there could be any number of things. So think, correct. Or you're using animal feces, mm -hmm. not uh, uh, manures, but you may be putting cat feces in there, dog feces in there. No. Uh, so it's really good to go through the two-hour class, and if you're brave enough, the 16-hour class, yes. which is really good. That's the good one. You get to learn a lot about composting. Uh, so right now there are no ordinances about composting. The other one was on. Uh, rainwater harvesting. Rainwater harvesting, the only thing Code has ever said to me about that is especially related to the barrels, right? The 55 or 60 gallon barrels is try to hide those barrels, secure them and put them in an area that the public can't see. Instead of in your front yard, you might want to screen it, okay? Paint it. Uh, we've been known to have, have painted barrels. You can paint them to match the color of your house or match the, the surroundings it's in. Nice. Screen it in some way. And in the in the code side, in the code side, you'd also want to keep it behind the structure, not beside the structure or in front. So it'd have to be behind the actual structure line. And also another thing that she was getting to is covered because of mosquitoes. 
a screen or some form of funneling system with a screen on it because mosquitoes can get through funnel holes also and they'll breed in that water. So as long as it's covered. And you can use a mosquito gun, but I would uh, really tell you that in a, a rainwater harvesting, and I, I have four of them myself, four 55 gallon bar barrels. Water doesn't last very long. When you're using it, you're using it, 55 gallons goes really fast. Now, if you're wanting to get into a larger collection units, you, you may, and you're wanting to irrigate and do some elaborate stuff, well, you might want to visit with code and building inspection when it's a larger cistern type of situation where you're collecting hundreds or thousands of gallons. Okay. All right. So, Bill, if you wouldn't mind staying for a okay. And then you all feel free to visit, visit with Bill and he, your email address. I can get that Amy to him at cityofirving.org and I can get that all to you. Check. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.